Good morning. Welcome, everybody. You tell me I need to stay on time because we have people watching online. So <laughs> um, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, as Donna reminded me, it's way early for her. So uh, uh, she thinks the morning starts at 10 o'clock. Ten o'clock. Some of us get up a little earlier. Uh, but thanks for being here, Donna. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Uh, means a lot. And I just wanted an uh, opportunity to make a few comments uh, as I uh, make my exit as president of the Health Science Center today uh, as my last day. And, um, and so I appreciate you being here to, uh, to share in that with me. Um, so let me, let me just kind of start off by uh, talking about a story that means a lot to me. It's a story probably many of you have heard many times and um, and uh, I appreciate the latitude to kind of cover several different things while I'm while I'm getting to speak to you uh, one more time. Uh, I think um, for me it starts with uh, a famous quote that we've all heard many times before, and the quote was uh, from a speech in April of twenty, excuse me, of nineteen ten. It was at a famous university in Paris, the Sorbonne and uh, the university that's still active. And it was from um, a president who was no longer in office. He left office in, in 1909, and uh, he had just completed a year traveling all over the world, collecting exhibits for the Smithsonian. And he had, was asked to give a speech <coughs> uh, at the Sorbonne on the citizens of the Republic. And at that time, the United States was a fairly young country. Europe was the old world. And there was tension there and, and some understanding. Uh, uh, hard to imagine a world that actually existed where people didn't understand each other, right? Uh, that's actually a joke. It's OK if you laugh. Uh, so I th and this is the story of Theodore Roosevelt giving the man in the arena speech. Uh, it's a speech uh, and a comment piece of the speech. Uh, this ought to make you feel a lot better. My speech is like three pages. His was 35 pages and they didn't have air conditioning. Uh, so I think the point is though, that this this quote has had a lot of meaning to me in my life and my, in my career. And uh, I thought about it today, about sharing it with you from a perspective of meaning and a pr perspective of a couple of things I wanna to speak to. So I'll read it verbatim. Um, this particular segment of the 35 pages, um, and I, I would encourage you, if you haven't ever done it before, get online and there's another part of the speech that they never quote that actually speaks to some things very relevant in today's world in the US um, about people being divided and about how leadership and power can often get mixed up. And uh, it's, it's really, really helpful. So you realize that uh, history really does repeat itself in different forms. But the quote is this, is, it's not the critic who counts, not the one who points out how, how the strong man stumbled, or how the doer of deeds might have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with sweat and dust and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again. Who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who, if he wins, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So that is his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. What I want to speak to this morning is about choosing a life with worldly success or choosing a life with significance. See, we get to define what success is for ourselves. Often the world will tell us what success is. 
But others tell us what significance is. Others tell us. Maybe they never tell us. Maybe it's said behind us if we've lived a life of significance. As I thought about this this morning, I thought, you know, uh, my intent is not to preach at you or lecture to you, but uh, being the son of a Baptist preacher, it may kind of fall into that a little bit. So bear with me. But there's some, some deep understandings of this topic to me that mean a lot. And many of you are living lives of significance. The people I want to speak to are the people who are choosing lives of success because they think that's what the world wants. And I'm going to speak to it from the perspective of my own life. Because I think when you live in the arena, you live a life of significance. I'm sorry, can I? Can somebody get me a bottle of water? Or here's one. Never mind. So. When you live in the arena, you live with a lot of significance. And significance is about other people. So it's a life lived for others. And as I thought about it, I thought, you know, there's three qualities it takes to live in the arena. It takes an attitude of caring, caring for others. And that comes with vulnerability. That comes with sharing compassion and care for others. It comes with living a life of trust. With trust, you have to give trust to get trust. And when you give trust, that takes courage. But in order to be a part of a team, a team of significance, you have to be willing to give. You have to be willing to be courageous. So, you have to write the attitude, attitude of caring, demonstrate trust and share trust. And lastly, live truly with a life of purpose. Purpose that's not self-serving, but a purpose that is outwardly lived. And purpose comes with living with passion, living with sacrifice, and I believe living with no excuses. So as I thought a lot about this, I was reminded of some of my experience in my life. So if you bear with me a little bit, I'm gonna talk for a minute, first and foremost, about an attitude of caring. So on a cold sleep, sleep filled night in November of 1978, I walked out of the library in what was then the seventh floor of the EAD and ultimately through a series of events, was run over by a car and left paralyzed in the parking lot. Back then, we only had two security folks trying to cover 33 acres, so there wasn't anybody there at the time, except for my fiance at the time, who was running around trying to find help. Hopefully, that event that night was made up by a series of choices I made. Choices to step into a situation that probably I could have easily avoided, but I stepped in because I thought it was the right thing to do in the moment. And as a result, my life changed. In the moment, my life was threatened, but my, my life was also changed. And for the next year of recovery, I lived with paralysis. I lived with a lot of changes in my life. But what I experienced in the six weeks that I was in ICU and in the hospital was faculty members from TCOM who I had in classes coming to me, not with just cards, but with books that I still have that has their notes in them. They're gone. Because they showed an attitude of caring far beyond. Now, there are a lot of people that didn't come and that's perfectly fine. But what we'll find out is in the old 80-20 rule, there's probably 20% in the arena and 80% outside the arena. And those 20% are the ones that make lasting significance in people's lives. I can still tell you exactly how it made me feel 
when I knew faculty members, fellow students, staff members from over here came to check on me because they didn't have to. One thing they said was, you're one of ours. And that's why we're here. So from 1978, I always knew I was part of a special place. And the point I want to be sure you understand is it doesn't take big dramatic acts to show significance. It just takes small acts of courage and vulnerability and caring. I think it also takes for those people a spirit of humility and a willingness to share a little bit of themselves. So what I knew after that experience was what those people really stood for. And it was not anything that came up in the classroom. It was something that existed beyond the classroom space. So the point I want to make to all of you on this point is, doesn't matter what your position is, doesn't matter what your title is, doesn't matter if you have an office with a window, or who you report to, you have an opportunity to live every day with an attitude of caring about each other and about the work we're here to do. I think secondly, it takes, it takes trust, a willingness to give trust and have that courage to give trust. So about eight years later, I'm in my fellowship at Texas Heart Institute in Houston. And I'm on a team with a guy by the name of Denton Cooley, who a lot of people probably heard of, a lot of you probably never heard of. Uh, and his partner was a guy by the name of Dr. Keats, who was my boss. And so we did open heart surgeries all day long. But every Wednesday was pediatric day. Pediatric day involving bringing in infants and small children who had all kinds of forms of what we refer to as cyanotic heart disease. In other words, their body wasn't getting enough oxygen because of defects in the structure of their hearts. And they had traveled all over the world to get to the Texas Heart Institute because of the renowned brand and, and reputation it had. But we had this routine in anesthesia because the babies could not afford the anxiety of crying, separating from their moms or their dads. So we had worked out a routine whereby we would come out and talk to the mother. And again, in anesthesia, we were always, I always said, we were always like at a big disadvantage because we meet people and have to build trust within five or 10 minutes. Trust where we're gonna take complete control of their life and render them unresponsive and bring them back. I used to joke some of my surgeon friends because they would say, anesthesia is always late, always late, always late. I see Dr. Yuvada here, I gotta give him back. And I'd say, yeah, but go ahead and start without me. Let's see how that works for you. <laughs> so, uh, but the point is, that particular, one particular morning that changed my life was another small act of courage. And so the routine was I'd come out and talk to the mom or the dad or both, lick the baby, I'd listen, to their, listen to their chest. I'd go back to the, to the OR, grab a particular syringe. What I would explain to the parents was, I'm about to come back out here. When I come back out here, we're not going to have a second time to talk. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this syringe out of my pocket and I'm going to stick it right through the, the infant's gown into their leg and inject it. And they're going to start going to sleep immediately. And I've got to grab them and go. Because I can't afford any crying, any anxiety, any recognition of what's going on here. And it happened in just a matter of seconds. So this particular time, I explained all this to this lady. She was by herself. And I went back to the OR, grabbed my syringe, 
walked back up, whipped it out like I always did, and started to give it. And she grabbed my hand. And she said, bring him back to me. Because he's all I've got. I lost my husband and my other child in a car accident a year ago. So whatever you do, bring him back to me. And I tried to take all that in a matter of a couple of minutes, give the injection and go, knowing we had to, we always felt pressure, but now, but now all of a sudden the pressure was, was, was feeling insurmountable almost. But what I learned later from her, and the baby did fine, we got, you're probably wondering about that part. Uh, and the disadvantage we had was we did the surgery and then we might not ever get to see them again. But in that moment, again, just a short moment of human interaction, she taught me how you can trust in a matter of minutes. She trusted me with her most loved, cherished possession, if you will. To take it away from her, put it through her horrendous procedure, get it to a better place. And there was no guarantees. There was no guarantees it was going to go right. But in that moment, she gave complete trust. I don't know if I could do that. And I don't know if you can do that. But that's what relationships with other human beings calls for, I believe. It's a willingness to give trust on face value. And then, over time, let it build experientially. But to live in the arena with a life of significance, you have to be able to trust and be with others. And we all know from being here at the Health Science Center, it takes a teamwork, amount of teamwork, and teamwork takes trust. So an attitude of caring and trust. In that moment, she stepped into the arena and she showed me a lesson. And I also knew at that moment, actually I didn't know at that moment, I learned it later, that because I'd been here, I was prepared in a way of how to be as a professional provider. I was only a fellow. I just finished my residency. But TCOM had taught me how to care for people, how to have a, a sense of empathy and compassion in the moment. And that's because of the people here exhibit compassion and empathy. So these lives that we're training here to go out and take care of other lives, believe me, it does get passed on and other people's lives are impacted. Again, no matter what job you do, you have, a make, you have an opportunity to make a difference. And then, then in December of, of uh, 2012, I was serving on the Board of Regents and the board had asked me if um, a crazy idea would I consider stepping off the Board of Regents and um, and giving up a really good job that I'd done a lot of work to get it to a really good place. And we were very happy to leave it and take on the Health Science Center that had a leadership issue from a perspective of a real need from for a transition from the perspective of the board. Of course, I waited until I was out of town to have that meeting because I was on the board. I should have been in the meeting. Um, and so, again, it took it took a moment of of decision making, but you might think that decision was really hard because I literally had 48 hours to make the decision, to pick up my family and move, to walk into a situation that I knew had a lot of issues from the leaders, from at least from the presidential perspective. But I believe there were good people here because there were good people here when I came here before, but that had been 32 years earlier. 
So I decided to accept it. And the one reason I decided to accept it was because I, I realized that it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to give back to the place that gave me a chance when nobody else would. And so through that process, support I felt here, the support uh, that has been in this community has been rich. Uh, yeah, there's days I, I have thought of, I was kind of all by myself for a while there, but uh, oftentimes I'll attribute that to maybe it's just a crazy idea I'm having and everybody else has got sense. Um, but I think, I think what I've learned is there's still a lot of caring here. There's still trust here. And there's so much potential for where this place can go. So I have never looked back after for the last 10 years of making that decision. But I do, I mean, I am mindful every December 20, 21st of each year. Because I can tell you, December 21st, 2012, while the board was making their decision to fire another president, they had me in seclusion in this building waiting for them to make a decision. And what they told me was, by the way, when you quit your job and you call the governor to quit your board position, there's no guarantee we're going to do this. We might change our mind. And so what I said, does that mean what I think it is? They said, yeah, you'd be without a job. But again, it was the right thing to do. And again, I've never looked back. And again, you have continued to reward me with reasons why it was the right decision. But I believe me, <laughs> there were people that told me they didn't know why I was here and they didn't want me here. There were people that told me they just flat out didn't want me here. And there were people that said, I have no idea why you're here. And uh, but that's okay. And I had one lady uh, at one point who was on the foundation board who, who told me, I don't like you, but for some reason, I feel like I've got to trust you. And I said, you know, I don't really care if you like me, but if you're willing to trust me, we can go from there. And now she's a friend. But that's how it started for me from, from, from this perspective of the purpose, this place, this place, in my opinion, at that point, had lost its purpose because of leadership. It wasn't because of the people. People were dying to live with a purpose. And so you have continued to demonstrate that, and we have lived with purpose. And I'm very proud of what all we've accomplished together. So there's an attitude of caring, a level of trust, And lastly, living with a purpose. And so as a result, I thought it would be kind of fun just for a second to walk through some of the things we've we've done together. So board, so just this is like, uh, you know, when the, your parents start talking, telling stories and just kind of ignore me for a second, but just let me do this, okay? Because I just want to do it. Uh, In 2013, we got the pharmacy school started. When I got here as a pro forma, there was a dean, Dean Jacobson, who had been one of my professors before, had already been picked as the founding dean. But we got the pharmacy school off the ground. And now 500 graduates later, we got people ever in lots of places, and especially in the Metroplex, that are providing pharmacy care. We got a crazy idea to go to the state and get them to fund a patient safety institute because patient safety was not being taught anywhere in Texas and it was not being taught here. And it was a passion of mine. As a result of that, starting that institute and I asked my friend Brett Giroir to come and help me get it off the ground and he did a beautiful job of that. And we got to work together for the better part of a year. And as a result, that was a perfect example of how something can get started and then others 
and I want to thank the, the folks at TCOM especially who took that on and have taken it now to where it's a national brand for TCOM as being a patient safety leader in the country. And um, that all came from because of the Institute got approved by the legislature. Our research awards has, have just about tripled, if not tripled, in that time from uh, a little over 30 million to over 100 million. We've continued to invest in research and I, and I hope and, uh, that that will continue to go on and I know it will. We did something crazy and we started an entrepreneurship program, an innovation program here. And we got Cameron uh, to take on a crazy idea to join join me here with Rob and and um, leadership with Brian Gladue. And, and as a result now, the program has had multiple startups, the tech transfer program that's really working. And we just now brought the first accelerator program to Tarrant County, which there wasn't really one had not been here and tell for you those of you who don't know what an accelerator program is it's a program that gets new businesses started so now we're bringing many entrepreneurs from all over the world here to start companies that are all about a topic we picked which was physical therapy and so our school of health professions is involved in that as well through a crazy idea dr uh, rusty reeves had we created the Center for Anatomical Services. It wasn't just an anatomy department anymore. It was a Center for Anatomical Services and a Will Body Program. Will Body Program that served families of indigent populations in the, in the county and how we help them through a process of providing uh, loved ones for scientific use at the same time, gave them a, a ceremony and a, and, a, and a recognition and opportunities to be a part of of training our students. We didn't raise tuition for 10 years. That was the angst of a lot of people probably, but but I'm proud of that. And we've we've not put our any, any of our increased costs on the backs of students. All right, we heard from uh, we heard from all of you that we needed a place for child care. We structured a partnership with Lena Pope home and uh, as a result of that we uh, uh, decided we don't want a child care center, we want a child learning center, and now we have the early learning center. We constructed the IRB and imaging center. We took the, the student services building now, which is a beautiful building. At the time, it was an old a medical office building and turned it into a place, hopefully and ideally, at least for a while until it outgrows itself, which it may be on the way to that now, for students to go to a one-stop shop uh, for the services they need. And then when COVID hit, we recognized the vast need and we set up the first, first responder testing place in Tarrant County, ended up being one of the first testing places, period. And then we, we also went, carried that through working with the county and the city on vaccination programs. Something near and dear to my heart and many of you is we, we work through a process of defining our values and defining what it means to have a values-based culture. And I still to this day, have candidates coming in here to be hired who bring up the fact that this place is different. This place has a different sense, a different feel. And the values and the culture keep coming out. And we define a new vision as one university and we define a mission of creating solutions for others. And, a, and we talked about a purpose for transforming lives. We were successful in getting 700 new residency slots agreed to by health systems to be created over the next seven years. Those will all be ours. We don't have any control of who goes to what residencies, but we're working. I know Dr. Phil Petto and others have been working to secure enough of GME slots for our graduates. Thanks to, thanks to Desiree's work, we set up our first really active compliance program and integrity program. We didn't, we really didn't have one before. We worked on policies. We had 400 policies. We took those down to less than 90 policies. She did and her team. Uh, and uh, ran it over time. That'll build up again, but hopefully won't get out of control as it was. We've got, gotten a lot more community awareness and respect. We have a new brand image. We hired these consultants, paid them a lot of money. And in the end, we had to fire them. And that image got drawn on the back of a napkin, literally by a couple of people. 
We set up the valuability program, which was the first rewards and recognition program we had. And we set up and we have grown our financial strength now in the last 10 years. Our primary reserves have gone from 80 million to almost 240 million. Just to give you a comparison, UNT, which is a 130 year old school, has only got about 10 million more than we do. Our endowment's grown from 27 million to, to around 125 million. And our total assets have grown from 300 to 600 million. And then the last one, which you know you don't get to do very often as 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 a guy in my position, is I got to pick my successor. So Dr. Trent Adams showed up here one day in January of 20 thinking she was just here to give a lecture. I thought she was just here to give a lecture on the opioid crisis. But something happened to me in that period of time. We met afterwards in my office. And I don't know why I do things like this, but I, I think I know why, because I try to live with my faith. But I was I felt compelled that I just asked her, what are you going to be doing after you get out of military service and public health service. So over the next eight or nine months, nothing happens, no conversations. Then all of a sudden I got a call from her and the conversation we had had in my office on that one day, an hour after I met her, led to where we are today. So I want you to welcome uh, Sylvia or Trent Adams uh, later on today, about four o'clock, the board will be meeting. Uh, without any doubt in my mind, they will name her as, as uh, the next president of the Health Science Center. Sylvia. Is that better? Excellent. OK, great. Talk about a tough act to follow in more ways than one. But I want to say thank you, Dr. Williams, for your remarks today. And good morning to all of you. I'm happy to see that so many of you are here to recognize Dr. Williams and his immeasurable accomplishments. I know that we have a lot of people participating also online. And it's, it's a great day for HSC, not only to recognize Dr. Williams and his accomplishments, but also as we will hopefully start a new chapter this evening but after the board's decision. Um, I'm excited that we will be implementing the values-based culture across the entire UNT system. I think that this is you know, primarily one of the main reasons I came here to HSC. Um, in 2020, I came as a senior vice president and the, the uh, chief strategy officer. And I knew that the moment I set foot on this campus in January of 2020, there was something very special about this place. It was palpable. You couldn't really figure out what it was, but in interacting with the students and the faculty that day, I noticed there were two things. There was an energy. There was uh, this whole belief that everyone comes together as a community to solve problems. And that resonated with me. During the opioid crisis, I think we saw the best and the worst of humanity. And much of the work that had been done here at HSC was trying to do as Dr. Williams talked about in his remarks, care, have empathy, and show compassion, and have that humanitarian side of all of us come to the forefront. People here at HSC genuinely have the desire to make a difference in people's lives, and I wanted to be a part of that. I truly believe that this process of values-based culture as we take this journey across the system will take HSC and the UNT system to the next level. I also want to be sure to thank Dr. Williams for his service to HSC. A lot has changed since he was, he was named the sixth president in 2013, and even more since he was a TCOM student here in 19... <laughs> 18, 18. <laughs> Yeah, I think he was present at the Sorbonne when that, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. He, he did such, a, such an eloquent job of recanting that. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, but under his leadership, HSC really has embraced a, a values-based culture. And it's, it looks at that collaborative and an innovative team culture. And I think that's so important, not only in healthcare, but in health professions training. 
you know, when I was training as a clinician, one of the things that I remember my professors telling me in nursing school was that when you train well, you build a pathway for people to do well. And so I think that that's absolutely what's happening here on this campus is espousing the values-based culture is teaching us to respect one another, to come together as community, to have a sense of collaboration, but also, also to be innovative and think into the future. In just two, in the last two years, HSC has helped lead COVID-19 efforts within the DFD, DFW community, um, addressing health literacy, contact tracing, testing, and vaccinations. HSC really does partner with all of its community members to make the community a better place. HSC is partnered for the partnered for the first time last year with Remote Area Medical, also known as RAM. And we provided free dental, vision, and medical care to underserved and uninsured people. And we are getting ready to put on our second clinic this December. HSC collaborated with the City of Fort Worth, Tarrant County, and Golf Capital to bring Techstar's Physical Health Fort Worth Accelerator Program, that's a mouthful, to the city. And that, ex and that exciting program is kicking off this week. So see Cameron for more information. Um, during Dr. Williams' tenure, He's done a lot of, of work to significantly strengthen HSC's financial position and without raising tuition, as he mentioned. But I think, Dr. Williams, the impact that you've had on the community, the students, the faculty, and the staff is immeasurable. I want to thank you for your service, for making HSC a better place to work and to go to school. We all wish you continued success in your role as a UNT system chancellor. But I want to leave you with a quote, and this is something, one of the, my favorite quotes is from Maya Angelou. Dr. Williams, this is for you. They may forget what you said, they may forget what you do, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that this is a quote that is attributed, attributed to you and your legacy here at HSC, because many of us have been impacted directly by your thoughts, your deeds, your compassion, your empathy, but more important for you as a human being. Thank you for all that you have done for HSC and all that you will do and continue to do for the UNT system. So Dr. Williams, we applaud you for all that you have accomplished in your role as president of HSC and all that you would do as a, continue to do as a chancellor. Thank you, President. Thank you. I was going to share with you a quote that my daughter suggested I use. Now, mind you, I have a 21-year-old who is a communications major. She says, Mommy, just use the one from Nanny McPhee. And I said, Nanny McPhee? She says, yeah, that Nanny, Nanny McPhee. And I remember this movie. It was hilarious. If you haven't seen it, it's great great for a, a cold afternoon and <laughs> some popcorn and, and tea. Um, but it, and Nanny McPhee, as she was on this journey, she came in as the nanny for this very disruptive group of kids which is like HSC back in the day. <laughs> and this gentleman was a widower and um, she was trying to get the family reconnected, bring everyone back together, have a semblance of order, process and, and success. And so Nan McPhee had this saying as she was, the kids just did not want her there. They did everything they possibly could to get her to leave. And at the end, you start to see her appearance change but you also see the kids begin to show much more compassion for her and they become a family. And so Nanny McPhee said, when you need me, you will not want me. When you want me, you will not need me. Now that doesn't apply to you because we still need you and we want you here, <laughs> but you've done so much to set up HSC for success. And I hope that you will continue to do so for the system, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. She's a tough duck. I don't know who's going to have to follow her in a few years. I'm glad it's not me. Um, the last things I want to say is, first of all, again, thank you all for making the effort to be here. It means a lot. Um, and I, I, I think we have about 220 people online. And so I want to make a couple of comments there. This is just a housekeeping, and I'll have my closing remarks. Um, 
we didn't we didn't set this town hall up to be q and a and and like a regular town hall. This was just an opportunity for me to express some things to you all and share some sentiments that I have after all the years we've been together. Uh, there'll be future town halls for that, and there'll be a lot of listening sessions going on in the coming coming weeks and months. So I want you to know there's opportunities for you to be heard uh, and address some issues. But let me just finish with this. Um, <clears throat> Again, I want to reiterate, this is not about your position, your title, your anything. This is about a mindset, a mindset you have to have. And to have an attitude of caring, to have a sense of trust, a willingness to give others trust, to live with a purpose, to be part of something, as the old quote goes, to plant a seed of a tree that you'll never sit under the shade of. The health science center goes on. The health science center will become what it's going to become into the future, and I have great hopes and a lot of confidence that it's going to be fantastic. But we get to choose whether to be a part of something bigger than ourselves or not. And so it's easy to choose world success, worldly success, it's harder to choose significance. But I would just ask you this question. Would you want 20 years from now to have somebody standing up here or 40 years from now talking about a little act you did when they were in the hospital? A little act that you did to show trust to somebody in a complete stranger moment. Or something you did to show someone a sacrifice of yourself to live a bigger purpose. I hope you'll choose significance. It's what life's really about. So thank you all very much. I appreciate everything you've done. I appreciate your dedication to Health Science Center, its students. You know, in the 10 years I've been here, we've probably graduated. I don't know, Trisha probably knows. I'm going to guess somewhere between um, six to seven hundred every year, so six to seven thousand. Those those are those students are out there now. They're no longer students; they're professionals. They're making discoveries. They're creating companies. They're leading health systems. They're caring for patients. If you just think about the average internist, sees about fifteen hundred patients in a in a practice, the family practitioners. 7,000 times 1,500. Granted, you got public health folks out there saving the world from of major issues. So don't ever take the work you do lightly. And I don't care what the job you do is. I was taught important lessons by, by four people here who are no longer here. Um, Susan, I saw here, Susan Ross, who was uh, with me through a lot of battles over a number of years. And I'm, I really appreciate her being here today. It means a lot. But there are three other people who have gone on and no longer are with us. Danny Jensen. Danny taught me a lot of lessons. Taught me a lot of lessons about caring, about doing what it takes to get to know folks in ways beyond what their jobs titles are. And it really made a difference in a lot of the things we tried to do. Jose Diaz. Jose Diaz to a lot of people was just a painter. Jose had a painting crew and I watched Jose paint this piece of art out here, I call it the valuability wall. You know, he's, he was an amazing artist, but more importantly, he was a philosopher. You might not have known that because every morning I get in my truck, he would be right there and he'd stop me. And he would have something to say that was meaningful for the rest of my day was always positive and upbeat. And then, then another, the last one is Dean Conan. Dean was the head of the landscaping crew. Dean always had his straw hat on. He was always walking the talk by being right there with his guys all the time. And I had a conversation with Dean one time and I said, Dean, you're always smiling. And he said, I love my work because I get to educate students. I said, explain that to me. 
He said, because Bakru makes the campus beautiful. And it's the first impression parents and students see when they come to campus. And they know that if we care about our landscape and they care about our buildings, we're going to care about them. So once again, thank you all for being here. Don't ever underestimate your potential to live with significance. I love you all. Thank you very much.